Pediatrics coming at you, baby. So inborn errors of metabolism. Let's get started. So we're going to start with carbohydrate metabolism disorders. Um, the two I'm going to talk about that the boards like to test you on is fructosuria and galactosemia. So notice right away, urea, fructose in the urine. Um, this is a problem with the fructokinase. Um, you have a fructokinase deficiency in the enzyme, and it is an autosomal recessive um, pattern of inheritance. Now, what it does is it causes elevated fructose and its metabolites in not only the urine, but also in the blood. Now, this fructosuria is a, it's, it's pretty much a benign condition, but now galactosemia, this causes elevated galactose and metabolite levels also in the blood and the urine. Um, this is one of the five things that we screen for um, with the newborn screening test, and its problem is it has a galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase deficiency. Now, that enzyme is high yield to know. Definitely remember that one. They like that on the boards. He also has an autosomal recessive um, type of inheritance, and you look for the triad of liver failure, number one, renal tubular dysfunction, so you're going to have electrolyte abnormalities that could throw it that way at you, and also cataracts. Now, how would you treat galactosemia? To treat galactosemia, you exclude two things from the diet. Obviously, number one, exclude any galactose, and you also exclude lactose from the diet, right? Because we don't need... Um, because remember, you got hexokinase out there. He can phosphorylate any six carbon sugar, um, and then you're going to have problems, right? You want to sugar pulls water, so we could get cerebral edema because um, you don't need insulin for um, glucose getting to the brain. I mean, etc. So that's the problems with these carbohydrate metabolism disorders. But those are the two you need to remember, and those are the two enzymes. Moving right along, cholesterol synthesis disorders. We have smith lemma optit syndrome, or SLOS. This is caused by a mutation of 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase. Okay, and you're saying, what the heck is that? Well, basically what this does, oh, first of all, this is by far the most common inborn error, inborn error of cholesterol metabolism. Okay? By far the most common inborn error of cholesterol metabolism synthesis. Um, it causes the inability to correctly produce or synthesize cholesterol due to a low occurrence of 7-DHC reductase, which is 7-dehydrocholesterol reductase. A lot, a lot of people overlook this disease, but it, it is, like I said, it's the most common cause of inborn error of cholesterol synthesis. smith lima optic syndrome. Okay, so don't overlook this one for the boards. and It's more on step two, but you never know. Step one could come at you that way. So patients, well, what happens to them, they suffer from microcephaly and diffuse cognitive delay that may resemble an autism disorder or an autism spectrum disorder. That's how you'll to know. may be mistaken. for autism. Okay? And like I said, they have microcephaly and diffuse cognitive delay. Um, they also have malformations of the heart, the genitals, the lungs, the kidneys, um, the GI tract. Those are all common. As well as they also have polydactyly and syndactyly. Okay? Now, the molecular genetic analysis of the DHCR7 gene is how you confirm the diagnosis. So you need to do genetic testing to confirm the uh, diagnosis of smith levi optic syndrome. Okay, that's, that's pretty much the high yield there. You need to know the enzyme and know it's very common and it can be mistaken for autism. So the hyperlipidemias, everybody loves these, right? So let's start with endogenous hypertriglyceridemia. So you have, you have an endogenous production of too much triglycerides in the blood, all that means. It's caused by an overproduction or a reduced clearance. So it could also be um, a reduced clearance or overproduction 
overproduction um, of VLDL. Um, now, patients with this disorder, endogenous hypertriglyceridemia, will be number one, obese, and have glucose intolerance. Sound familiar? Metabolic syndrome. Okay, so those are the two things that you will look for. Um, and just know the high yield point to know is the problem is with VLDL. So hypercholesteremia type 2, this is large elevations in serum cholesterol, usually greater, the number you need to know, usually greater than 500 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? Um, they can get ten, tendinous xanthom, xantho, xanthomata. buzzword for you. Tendinous symptomata. Um, these people also a good a good tip off clue on the boards for hypercholesterolemia type 2 is they get early atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Early atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So with that said, what is it? First of all, let's it's the thing you need to know is it, it is a deficiency of the LDL receptor. It's a deficiency of the LDL receptor. So how do we treat um, this familial hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia type 2? What do you think? Well, obviously, you have too much cholesterol in the blood, right? So the number one drug we're going to use is statins. Um, you can also use cholecystyramine. Or you can do a liver transplant. Um, and the liver transplant is for the homozygous form. Okay. Now, the one thing here that they could go for, the, the statins. How could a statin, because a statin is a very basic drug at RPH, so that means it can get into your brain, it can get into your muscle, it can get into your pancreas, your skin, etc. It's very... Um, lipophilic, fat soluble, high volume distribution. Um, how could, because um, you know the, the kidneys handle water soluble things and usually water soluble things don't cross a lipid bilayer. So how does statins put you in renal failure if you, um, if you take too much of them? Well, we just said that can get into your muscles, right? So that um, myoglobin in the muscle could cause rhabdomyolysis and um, myoglobin is incredibly toxic to the kidney so you can get renal tubular acidosis from a statin. And another thing that a lot of people do not know, statins work on uh, HMG-CoA reductase. A lot of people know that, but it, that enzyme is most active at around 8 to 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. So this drug should always be taken at nighttime. Okay, make sure you tell your patients that because even though if they take it in the morning, let's say, their cholesterol You'll see it drop, but if you really want to see it drop, um, the way the drug is designed to work, it should be taken at night. So that's a big point with the statins. Um, very popular drugs. There's only one renally cleared statin. You know what it is? Provostatin. Very good. So hyperchylomicronemia type 1. This is due to a deficiency of lipoprotein lipase in the liver or the cofactor Apo lipoprotein C2. He's a big player here. Um, now, this causes what? This causes an accumulation of chylomicrons and a low to normal LDL. So the LDL could be normal, but the big thing is you got too many chylomicrons. All right. Um, there's a little tip off with, with this guy with the hyperchylomicronemia type 1. The patient's serum has a, a certain look to it. The patient's serum is grossly milky. That's right, grossly milky. Um, 
Patients also have eruptive xanthomas and periodic severe abdominal pain, like while uh, starting in infancy. Okay, so you usually, what would be a, a cause of their severe? Now, notice I said that word severe. There's only a few things that it can be if I say severe abdominal pain. Like you need to be thinking um, aortic uh, rupture, aorta in the abdominal area, or something like that, or dissecting aorta. Um, but the other one is um, pancreatitis. So if you ever see pancreatitis in infancy, I want you to default back to hyperchylomicronemia. I'm butchering that word. Hyperchylomicronemia type 1. There we go. Um, so let's write that in there. You can see pancreatitis in a newborn or in an infant, which will be extremely rare. So that is due to a deficiency of lipoprotein lipase or the cofactor apolipoprotein C2. They won't have both of those in the answer choice, but no, it could be due to either one. Um, and how, how would you treat hyperchylomicronemia type 1? You treat it with a very low-fat diet. That is how you treat this. Low-fat diet is the treatment all right and so that brings us to the last one this beta lipoproteinemia type 3 this is caused by an abnormal apolipoprotein e apolipoprotein e so absent chylomicrons leads to abnormal what two things Absent chylomicrons ends up giving you an abnormal LDL and DL, DL. Okay, so you have moderate, moderately severe elevations of cholesterol and triglyceride levels. So let's write that in there. So with a dis beta lipoproteinemia type 3, you have severe elevations of cholesterol and triglycerides. All right, that is very important to know. Patients have planar xanthomas. planar xanthomas and premature peripheral vascular and coronary artery disease. Now let's pause for a second. Which other thing have we talked about had early atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? Do you remember? That's right. Hypercholesterolemia type 2. Very good. So that's a little correlation with this beta lipoproteinemia type 3. Um, they have premature peripheral vascular and coronary artery disease. So the patients should focus, basically their, their treatment is they should focus on weight loss, dieting, and an exercise program. Um, you can also add, there's one thing you can add here, um, derivatives of fibric, not, not a, um, what am I trying to say, what, just fibric acid, okay? So the treatment, besides a weight loss diet and exercise program, is derivatives of fibric acid. Okay, fibric acid, and you can that can be added to the treatment regimen. So that is the high yield familial hyperlipidemias. Don't make it more complicated um, than it is. Just, just know what we talked about right there and you'll be fine with those. Um, so fatty acid oxidation disorders. Now these are something that a lot of people overlook. Okay, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily high yield, but I would definitely know them. So what do you need to know about glutaric acidemia type 2? 
just know that if you ever see um, a strange urine that smells like uh, sweaty feet and it's acrid, um, that is your clue that they want glutaric, not glutamine, glutaric acid demia type 2, which is a fatty acid oxidation disorder. But the more important one, carnitine transport defect, okay? Primary carnitine deficiency is the only genetic defect in which carnitine deficiency is the cause rather than the consequence of impaired fatty acid oxidation. High yield, remember that. Um, the most common presentation is progressive cardio myopathy. Keyword, progressive. Progressive cardiomyopathy with or without skeletal muscle weakness beginning at age one to four years old. Okay? Now, the diagnosis of the carnitine transporter defect is aided by the fact that the, pa the patients have extremely reduced carnitine levels in two things. Obviously, you're going to check the plasma, but they also have extremely reduced carnitine levels in the muscle as as far as one to two percent normal so crazy low carnitine levels in the serum and the muscle okay um, now the treatment of this disorder with pharmacological doses um, uh, you, you do pharmacological doses of oral carnitine. Let's just write that in there. You supplement them with oral carnitine at 100 to 200 milligrams per kilogram per day. 200 milligrams, 1 to 200 milligrams per kilogram per day. Now that's highly effective in correcting the cardiomyopathy and the muscle weakness if it is present, as well as any impairment in fasting what? Fasting ketogenesis. Remember, we're talking about fatty acid oxidations here. So with that said, why would this kid have a cardiomyopathy? Because the heart uses fats for energy at rest. The heart only switches to glucose when you really stress it, right? Very good. That, so make sure, try and connect these things to stuff you know, the basic sciences, and you won't have to memorize all this stuff, and it'll be much more enjoyable for you, and it'll be a lot more fun, and it'll actually make sense. So with that said, citrullemia. A citrullemia is an inherited it's inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. The gene is located on chromosome 9Q34.1. So I don't think that's that high yield, but there it is. Um, this is several disease-causing mutations that have been identified in different families. The recent introduction of neonatal screening for urea cycle defects has disclosed affected patients who are... <clears throat> who are um, asymptomatic, even with ingestion of a regular diet. So long-term follow-up is needed to be certain that these individuals do not sustain what? Neurological sequelae. Um, neurological sequelae. The severe or neonatal form, which is by far the most common, so the neonatal form is the most common, that's why we're talking about it in pediatrics here, um, appears within the first few days of life. And the signs with signs and symptoms of hyperammonemia. Now, what's the problem with too much ammonia on board in your blood? Well, any time that you have too much, number one, ammonia, number two, urea, or number three, acid. Hydrogen ions, or you could say CO2. CO2 is an acid because it dissociates once it combines with water um, into bicarb and H+. 
once you if you have a elevation of any of these three you eventually form glutamate the main um, excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain which gets decarboxylated so you lose the CO2 to form the good old gamma amino butyric acid that is a very important connection to make because that is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain and that's why we can't have these kids with too much ammonia in their blood because GABA will shut down everything and they'll die of heart failure. They're, I mean everything will shut down. The brain controls the body. So laboratory findings are similar, very similar to those found in patients with um, OTC deficiency except, except for what? Except that the plasma citrulline concentration is markedly elevated, like 50 to 100 times normal in citrullinia type 1. Okay? So the main difference in this and the OTC deficiency is that <clears throat> plasma citrulline levels 50 to 100 times normal. Um, in citrullinemia type 1 as compared to um, OTC deficiency, um, which I think is erotic transcarbamylase or something like that. Um, yeah. So moving right along with the fatty acid oxidation disorders, medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. MCAD is another way to say it. MCAD, right there it is. MCAD deficiency is the most common fatty acid oxidation disorder. Might want to remember that. The most common deficiency of fatty acid oxidation disorders, medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. Very high yield enzyme. Right there she is. Affected patients usually present in the first three um, months to five years of life with episodes of acute illness triggered by what? Triggered by prolonged fasting. Prolonged fasting. Um, longer than that, that meaning like uh, longer than 12 to 16 hours of fasting. Now, signs and symptoms include vomiting and lethargy, which rapidly progress to coma or seizures and cardiorespiratory collapse. Um, sudden unexpected infant death usually occurs and it can it can occur now acute illnesses or acute illness should be promptly treated with what obviously if it's acute we need IV fluids we need IV fluids immediately containing 10 percent dextrose 10 percent dextrose to treat or prevent hypoglycemia and to suppress what? To suppress lipolysis. Don't want to start breaking down breaking down fats, turning into ketones, right? Why? Why would you not want to do that? Because ketones are acidic. Remember I told you if you ever have too much H plus an acid on board, you form GABA, and that's why all this lethargy, um, cardiorespiratory collapse is happening. The diaphragm shutting down, GABA is saying, hey, slow down, shut, it's shutting you off. So um, that's why we, we, if it's acute illness, you give intravenous fluids immediately with 10% dextrose. Now, chronic therapy consists of avoiding fasting. It's that simple. Um, this usually requires simply adjusting the diet to ensure that overnight fasting periods are limited to less than 10 to 12 hours. So overnight is the problem. And you know, new, newborn infants, uh, they, they like to sleep. They need, they're rapidly growing. They need their sleep. So there is frequently a history of of previous sibling death due to unrecognized MCAD deficiency. That is a big clue right there. Previous sibling death due to unrecognized MCAD deficiency. And remember, this is the most common fatty acid oxidation 
disorder, you will be tested on this. Medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. So that's how you manage it. That's how you treat it. That's what it is. Moving on to the glycogen storage diseases. So first up is von Gerke's disease. So what is von Gerke's disease? Well, um, we're going to talk about type 1, which is a deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase. Um, phosphatase, so that's the enzyme in, at the last stage of gluconeogenesis to put glucose um, back in the system. So it's characterized by a deposition of glycogen in the liver, the kidney, and where else? Increased glycogen. And number one, the liver. Obviously where it is stored, the kidney. And number three, the intestines. Okay. Now, signs and symptoms. Um, it causes a fasting, as you might expect, hypoglycemia. Now, you get massive hepatomegaly. That's, that's a big clue with von Gerke's disease. Massive hepatomegaly. You also see elevated serum levels of four things. Lactate. Elevated levels of lactate, uric acid, cholesterol, and triglycerides. And that's more than you need to know for uh, step one, but now at least you know it. Um, they have renal complications. Um, they also have slow growth, diarrhea. They have bleeding disorders, so you can tie that right into your low-volume state. You know their signs and symptoms. Their what their electrolytes are going to look at look like. Um, so, do you think they're going to have tetanic muscle contraption contractions, or they're going to be hypotonic if they have all these bleeding disorders? Well, they're going to be hypotonic, right? They're going to have hypotonia, and they also also a lot of people overlook this. Von Gerke's can have gout. Don't forget that Von Gerke's can have gout. Now. The diagnosis, you administer epinephrine, glucagons, galactose, fructose, or glycerol, and it does not provoke a normal hyperglycemic response. So DNA tests are available for common forms. You can do an enzyme measurement. Um, and when you do a liver biopsy, which is what you'll end up doing, um, it'll show accumulation of glycogen in the cells, right? Because the glycogen can't get out because the very last enzyme in the process of gluconeogenesis, which occurs in the liver, you know, it, it can't work. So you're going to see an accumulation of glycogen in the cells. So what is the treatment for von Gerke's disease? Well, obviously, you avoid fasting. You try to maintain normal blood glucose levels. Um, nocturnal intragastric um, or frequent high-carbohydrate meals are the mainstay of treatment up to two years of age. After that, intragastric feedings of uncooked cornstarch may be sufficient. Um, and if you get refractory disease, von Gerke's can actually um, cause you to have a liver transplant. So it is possible to, you know, it go as far as to having a liver transplant for uh, von Gerke's disease. So that's all you need to know about von Gerke's. Let's talk about McArdle's disease. McArdle's disease, he has an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern, and he is caused by a deficiency of muscle glycogen phosphorylase, also known as myophosphorylase, if they try and throw that at you. This involves only what? Skeletal muscle. Involves only skeletal muscle. Okay? The way I remember that is M for muscle. Um, yeah. So you get an accumulation of glycogen in the subsarcolemma location. Increased glycogen in the subsarcolemma location. All right.
So you're going to have, what some symptoms they're going to have, they're going to have temporary weakness and cramping of skeletal muscles during or after exercise. That's when this is going to come on, right? Because they can't utilize their glycogen. It's stuck in the muscle, right? So there's no rise in blood lactate levels during exercise. There, let me say it again. There is no rise in blood lactate levels during exercise. So that could be a clue. So a characteristic um, second win with the initiation of what type of metabolism usually happens. How do they get their second win with McCardle's disease? Fatty acid metabolism. If they work out long enough, they start burning fast for energy. And that's when, you know, it usually takes 25, 30 minutes. That's why you need to work out at least that long if you're doing cardiovascular um, exercise um, for the heart to switch from using fatty acids um, so the muscles can use it now. Now, it, this is asymptomatic during infancy. That's important to know. Now, muscle biopsy and assay will show defective enzymes. You can also get myoglobinuria um, and serum CK is always elevated. Myoglobinuria and serum CK is always elevated. Now, what did we talk about earlier is the problem with myoglobin in my urine. Um, well, the buzzword for that is you can see muddy brown cast if they want to throw that at you. But on, th on top of that, I want you to recognize it can cause renal tubular acidosis. Myoglobin is an acid, okay? It's very acidic, and it will literally destroy the kidney. Um, so make sure that you make sure that you know that. So dietary modification is required with a high protein and high fat diet, okay? Um, now, what would we give before any type of? There's a certain sugar we give McCardle's disease um, before exercise with a proper warm-up period. You give them sucrose before they exercise with a proper warm-up period. Um, their prognosis is pretty good with a sedentary lifestyle. You know, but if they're out climbing hills and mountains every day, that, that could be a problem. All right, so um, the next one we're going to talk about, um, my favorite one, Pompeii's disease. I just like saying Pompeii. This is an inherited disorder of glycogen metabolism characterized by deposition of glycogen in the cardiac and skeletal muscle. Cardiac and skeletal muscle. Cardiac is the big one. Pompeii's you think cardiac. It is an Alpha 1,4 glucosidase, also known as acid maltase, deficiency. Okay, now there's generalized glycogenesis because the defect is in all cells. Okay, this results in an inability to convert mannose to glucose. They cannot convert mannose to glucose. So you get a rapid progressive cardiomyopathy, and that is the hallmark of. Pompeii's disease. You get a rapid progressive cardiomyopathy and that is the hallmark feature to distinguish Pompeii's disease from all the other glycogen storage diseases. Patients also exhibit um, macroglossia, hypotonia, and hepatomegaly. Death usually happens by one to two years of age. Death usually by one to two years of age. Now there's a way we can delay the disease progression, okay? Now, I didn't say cure. I said delay, and we do that with enzyme replacement, and that's what this recombinant alpha-glucosidase is all about. That is um, and replacing the enzyme to delay the progression of Pompeii's disease. Now, the diagnosis can be made by looking at the EKG. It'll show a shortened PR interval shortened PR interval. But the big thing I would remember is they get a rapid progressive cardiomyopathy as a as an infant or a youngster. So that's kind of a giveaway there. Moving right along, Hartnup's disease. So what is Hartnup's disease? Well it's an inherited defect in transport of neutral neutral amino acids. 
So all y'all that thought there was no biochemistry on boards too, little did you know, right? So it's an inherited defect in transport of neutral amino acids by the intestinal mucosa. Intestinal mucosa and renal tubules. Okay, now there's a sodium dependent transport system that we're talking about here. So the overall causes a deficiency of what? Overall causes a deficiency of tryptophan. That's what I want you to definitely remember. Did I write that on the next page? Yeah. Causes a deficiency of tryptophan. That's the high yield part. I was about to say, I thought I wrote that in there. Okay. And heart nubs disease is, like I said, an inherited defect in neutral amino acids by the intestinal mucosa and renal tubules. All right. So how do we diagnose or screen for this thing? Well, they're going to have an amino aciduria. They're going to have amino acids in their, in their urine, and they're going to be neutral amino acids. So this is why it's important to know your amino acids. Those include um, alanine. Let's try that again. Alanine, serine, threonine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, Phenylalanine, tryptophan, um, tyrosine, and histidine. All right, so those are your neutral amino acids. Now, you have normal plasma amino acid levels, so don't let that throw you. Make sure you recognize that right from the get-go. Normal plasma amino acid levels, but... You have amino acids and neutral ones at that in the urine that are spilling. Now, urinary proline, hydroxyproline, and arginine remain normal, remain normal in heart nubs disease, unlike what? Unlike Fanconi syndrome, where those will be elevated. So that's how you can differentiate Fanconi syndrome from heart nubs syndrome. But the main thing I remember with heart nubs is you have a deficiency of this guy, tryptophan. So the presentation or the signs and symptoms, it can be asymptomatic. But what you look for is you look for signs of cutaneous photosensitivity and episodic um, psychiatric changes. Now, the treatment is with nicotinic acid or nicotinamide and a high-protein diet in symptomatic patients. Remember, it can be asymptomatic in the presentation. So you can use nicotinic acid or nicotinamide, another way to say it, um, and a high protein diet is how you treat heart nubs disease. So that's pretty much heart nubs for you in a nutshell. On to another favorite one, homocystinemia or homocystinuria. So we probably should have called this lecture pediatric biochemistry. I feel like I'm teaching biochemistry over here. Um, know that this is an autosomal recessive um, problem and it's an inherited disorder of amino acid metabolism. No surprise there. In which um, homocysteine is present in greater than trace amounts in the urine. Now most commonly um, you have a deficiency of cystathione or cystathionine beta synthase. That's an important one to remember. Cystathionine beta synthase. Cystathionine beta synthase. But it can also be a defect of methylcobalamin formation or deficiency of methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. Okay? So don't let those big words fool you. We're just talking about vitamin B12 right here formation and methyl tetrahydrofolate. We're just making DNA. That's all we're doing. Um, as a result of this, homocysteine is not what? 
it is not remethylated. Now pay attention here. Not remethylated to methionine. And therefore, homocysteine accumulates. That is why, or why it accumulates, is because it is not remethylated to methionine, your start code on, right? So that is a problem. So how do we treat homocysteinemia or homocystinuria? Pyridoxine, pyridoxine responsive form, that's only half of them. They can be treated with high-dose vitamin B6, pyridoxine. Now, the pyridoxine unresponsive form re requires restriction of methionine intake and cysteine supplementation, which makes complete sense, right? You want to restrict methionine. You don't want that to build up, and you want to supplement with cysteine. So, the presentation of signs and symptoms... Um, this is, this is kind of different. It's similar in a lot of ways to Marfan's syndrome. Um, it shares some similar skeletal and ocular features of Marfan's syndrome. Do you know where the lens dislocates in Marfan's syndrome? Well, it dislocates from the bottom, right? Of the lens from the bottom. Why you can remember that is so they're always looking up at Mars, right? Marfan syndrome, because if they dislocate from the bottom, they're always looking up. Um, so they have a problem like going downstairs, for instance. They can't look down. So that's why you can remember that. Um, most commonly, um, they're normal at birth, um, but they have failure to thrive and developmental delays occurring later along the line. And they will have elevated methionine and homocysteine levels in body fluids. Very important to remember that. Elevated methionine and homocysteine levels in body fluids. And that is a problem because this causes clots. Right? So they can get strokes, MIs, etc. PEs. Um, lipidoses. Lipidoses. GM1 gangliosidosis. This is an autosomal recessive um, inherited disease. Now, you need to remember it is a deficiency of beta galactosidase, not gluco, but galactosidase. So you get an accumulation of GM1 gangliosides, um, specifically in the nervous system and, and places like that. Um, now, 50% of these children will have a cherry red macula but a clear cornea. What are some other diseases that have a cherry red macula? Well, um, Tay-Sachs is one. Neiman-Pick. So cherry red macula, don't don't just think Tay-Sachs right, right away. You think of a couple things. It could be this GM1 gangliosidosis as well. Um, some presenting signs and symptoms these kids will have. They will have hepatosplenomegaly. So they're going to have all kinds of trouble digesting um, fat-soluble vitamins. They're going to have trouble with their RBC, so they can have hemolysis. You're also going to see rashes, um, edema. And like I said, these get deposited in the, uh, um, the GM1 gangliosid gets deposited in the, the neurons. So they're going to have psychomotor retardation. You're going to see a lot of overlap um, with these lipidoses. So um, just look for that one thing that you can kind of hone in on to uh, better help you see which one the test writer wants you to pick. They also have coarse facial features. Um, this is big right here. They're usually blind and deaf. Blind and deaf um, by one year of age. And deaf is usually always... Um, by three to four years of age, um, they're going to either die of heart failure, cardiac complications, or they're going to have um, they're going to have some type of neurological um, defect that causes them to die. Um, 
They also have inclusions in their white blood cells. Inclusions in their white blood cells. And that's GM1 gangliacidosis. So what about GM2? Um, GM2, this is what falls under, this is where Tay-Sachs falls under, and also a disease that's overlooked a bunch, Sandhoff disease. Um, Tay-Sachs has a deficiency of the alpha, not the beta, but the alpha subunit of hexosaminidase A, not hexosaminidase B, hexosaminidase A. So remember A for A, alpha subunit, hexosaminidase A, Tay-Sachs. Okay, this results in accumulation of GM2 gangliocide in the brain. All right, um, make sure you remember that. So they're going to have neurological disorders as well. And it's also seen in Akinashi uh, Jews, Ashkenazi Jews. Um, so what is Sandhoff's disease? What's, what's the difference between the two? Sandhoff's is also an accumulation of GM2 gangliocides in the brain as well as the defining feature, peripheral organs. You don't see that in Tay-Sachs. They have more of a neurological only problem, okay? Now, Sandhoff's is a defective beta subunit, beta subunit of hexosaminidase A and B, okay? Um, diagnosis is usually about five to six months of age, um, death is usually around three to five years of age. These kids won't make it past that. They will have a cherry red macula, but a clear cornea, um, but a clear cornea. So let's go back, um, look at GM1 gangliosidosis. They have a cherry red macula, but a clear cornea as well in 50% of the cases. So that's not really that great of a defining feature. Um, but these kids will also have, with Sandhoff's disease, they will have an exaggerated startle response. And that's what's known as hyperacusis. Hyperacusis. So I would remember that. Um, also, another, another buzzword for you, they have a frog-like position. Now, there's no organomegaly in Tay-Sachs. I should have wrote that in there. Tay-Sachs. No organomegaly, but there is hepatosplenomegaly in um, in GM2 or, or Sandhoff's disease. They have hepatosplenomegaly in Sandhoff. So that's how you can differentiate the two. And these will also have um, normal white blood cells. Remember um, back back in uh, the GM1 uh, ganglioliposis, they had uh, white blood cell white blood cell inclusion. So Tay-Sachs and Sandhoff's will have normal white blood cells. And that takes us on to a good old Neiman Pick disease. Now, there's six subtypes of Neiman Pick disease, but the boards, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't waste your time learning all six of those. Just remember that it is a sphingomyelinase deficiency. So what happens is you get an accumulation of sphingomyelin and cholesterol in the reticular endothelial cells and the parenchymal cells. Um, some types have a red macula but all have a clear cornea. Every single last one have a clear cornea. And like I said, some types have a red macula. Um, they will have hepatosplenomegaly. They will have hepatosplenomegaly. Um, you, the diagnosis is usually about four months of age and death by three years of age. Now, what about foam cells with Neiman Pick disease? Where do you see foam cells at? What's important about them? You see those in bone marrow aspirates. Bone marrow aspirates. Now, when we said there were six subtypes earlier, the two I want 
you to remember um, they have a problem. There's a mutation in the SMPD1 gene. Okay, SMPD1 gene, which gives you Neiman Hick disease type A and B. Okay, Neiman disease type A and B. Now, um, some symptoms beyond what we've talked about. So if they have enlargement of the spleen, splenomegaly, or hepatosplenomegaly, where do you suspect this person to be bleeding from? Well, if they have splenomegaly, that's going to cause low levels of platelets, right, in the blood. So they're going to have thrombocytopenia as well. So they're going to be bleeding from skin and mucosal surfaces. So don't be thrown when you see that. Also, they have an accumulation of sphingomyelin in the CNS, um, which includes the cerebellum. So that usually results in some type of ataxia, dysarthria, which is slurring of the speech, or dysphagia, trouble swallowing. Um, they can also have basal ganglia dysfunction, which causes abnormal posturing, um, like dystonias. Um, now, the more widespread disease involves the cerebral cortex and on top of the basal ganglia and subcortical structures, which cause gradual loss of intellectual abilities. And the two you're going to look for is dementia and seizures. Okay? So that takes us into Gaucher's disease, or Goucher's disease. This is the most common type of lipid storage disorder, okay? This is the most common one, and it is autosomally recessively inherited. Now, this one has a problem with beta-glucosidase, or glucocerebrosidase is what it's another name for it. Um, that's what it's deficient in. That's the enzyme that it is losing. Now, this leads to um, accumulation of glucocerebroside in the reticuloendothelial system. So, obviously, they're going to have a pancytopenia, okay? So, their bone marrow is going to have trouble, just like Neiman Picks did. Um, they're going to have bone fractures. Bone fractures, bone pain. Bone pain and avascular necrosis. Avascular necrosis. Now, um, Gaucher cells in the bone marrow have a crinkled paper, crinkled paper-like look to them in the cytoplasm. Um, how do we treat this? Now, how do we treat Gaucher's disease? You do an enzyme replacement therapy. That's how you treat it. Now, some other ways or clues that the boards might give to you. This, this disorder is characterized by bruising, bruising, fatigue, anemia, low blood platelets, low blood platelets, and hepatosplenomegaly. Hepatosplenomegaly. Um, now, the enzyme glucocerebrosidase, it acts on fatty acid glucosal ceramide. This acts on fatty acid gluco, glucosal ceramide. Okay? Um, and like like I said, when the enzyme is defective, gluco glucosal ceramide accumulates, particularly in the white blood cells. Most often, the macrophages. That's why you might you might see them say mononuclear leukocytosis. Okay, so that could be a good clue for Gaucher's disease. All right, um, and glucosal ceramide, um, it, it also collects usually, like I said, in the reticular endothelial system. So we're talking about the liver and the spleen, um, the kidneys, but it can also uh, accumulate in the lungs, the brain, and specifically the bone marrow, which is why you get 
the pancytopenia. Okay, and that's Gaucher's disease for you. So Fabry's, what do we know about him? Well, Fabry's is X-linked recessive, so he's a little bit different. Now, you have an alpha-galactosidase A deficiency, but this enzyme is also known as um, ceramide trihexosidase. Ceramide trihexosidase. Uh, another way you can say that is globotriosyl ceramide. Globo tri osal ceramide. That's another way of saying ceramide trihexosidase. So you ever see globo triosal ceramide? That is the same thing. So all three of these enzymes are the same thing. Don't let that throw you. Now what you're going to see with Fabry's is um, um, an accumulation of glycosphingolipids in the vascular endothelium, that's the one I want you to remember, as well as nerves, all these affect the nervous system and other organs. Um, but the vascular endothelial system is what gets attacked the most. And that's why the Fabry's is at an increased risk of stroke, heart attack, kidney damage, etc. Fatty compounds start to line the blood vessels. So it's kind of like atherosclerosis of a young I think of this is atherosclerosis of a young baby, okay? Um, they also, some presenting signs and symptoms, they get angiokeratomas and telangiectasias. Um, they have severe neuropathic limb pain. Severe neuropathic limb pain. Um, now, check this out. They have asymmetric, asymmetric corneal clouding or corneal deposition. Corneal clouding. Um, they have progressive renal failure. They don't have hepatosplenomegaly, but they do have hepatomegaly, and they also have cardiac involvement with disease progression. So they're going to die of, you know, heart attack, stroke, MI, something like that. Um, but the main three things that, that get these people is they have an increased risk of stroke. That's that's what I want you to remember about Fabry's disease, because I think that's how they're going to go for it on the boards. If I was a question writer, that's how I would. Um, so Crabe's disease. This is autosomal recessive, and it is a problem with galactosal ceramide beta galactosidase or galactocerebrosidase. And then you have a deficiency in that enzyme. Now, it causes an accumulation of ceramide galactose within the lysosomes of brain white matter. So think brain white matter when you think of Krebs, uh, Krebs disease. You have a progressive CNS degeneration within the first six months of life. Now, you also see globoid cells in areas of demyelination, okay? So, they have an optic atrophy spasticity. They have early death, um, but they also have a clear cornea. They have a clear cornea. Now, hematopoietic stem cell transplants in infants uh, prior to the onset of neurological symptoms has been shown to be quite successive in this disease. Now, Krebs disease is caused by mutations, I should have wrote this in there, but I didn't, in the GALC gene. The GALC gene located on chromosome 14, specifically 14Q31 which causes um, deficiency of the enzyme, like we said, galactose reversidase. Now, in rare cases, it may, be, um, it may be caused by a lack of active, remember this word, this is a little different, active saposin A, active saposin A, that's rare though, okay? Um, 
Now, the GALC deficiency also results in a buildup, obviously, of glycosphingolipids called cycosine. Cycosine. Um, it has been suggested that cycosine causes axonal degeneration in both the CNS and the PNS by disrupting lipid rafts and may play a key role in uh, Craves disease. So that's how that's what you need to know about this guy. Moving on to Fabre Farber's disease, not Fabre Farber's disease. This is autosomally recessive in inheritance and it is a ceramidase deficiency which leads to an accumulation of ceramide in peripheral organs, joints, and the lymphoid tissue. Okay? In the lymphoid tissue. Um, these, these presenting signs and symptoms are a little different. They will appear normal at birth in Barber's disease. Um, the clinical onset is around four months of age. They're going to have nodules on their joints and also on their vocal cords. So they're going to have a hoarse voice as a youngster. As a four-month-old with a hoarse voice, think Farber's disease. They're going to have severe mental and motor retardation as well. Now, another way of saying Farber's disease um, is um, Farber's lipogranulomatosis. Farmer's lipogranulomatosis, um, also another way of saying it, they refer to it sometimes as fibrocytic dysmucopolysaccharidosis. Fibrocytic dysmucopolysaccharidosis. Now, um, these children are usually dead by two years of age, but the big thing here, the big thing um, is they have a problem with their lymph nodes. So you're going to see swollen lymph nodes on top of um, some, some other things like arthritis, um, joint contracture, which is chronic shortening of muscles or tendons around joints. Um, but the big one I like is the hoarseness of the voice, but they're also going to have xanthomas, no surprise there, um, which thicken around joints as the disease progresses. So the patients with breathing difficulty, um, they may require a breathing tube, and you need to know there is no treatment available for Farber's disease. Um, these lysosomal storage diseases are, are kind of a bear for, for patients and doctors. So moving right along, that takes us to MSUD, maple syrup urine disease is one of my favorites. So what is maple syrup urine disease? It is an inherited disorder of the branch-chained amino acids metabolism. You're going to see increased levels. Uh, the way I remember that is you can't, these people can't live, L-I-V. That stands for leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those are my branch chain amino acids. So you're going to have increased levels of leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And also corresponding oxoacids may accumulate in body fluids. The problem here is they have a branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase deficiency. Branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay? And like we said, the branch chain amino acids are live. Um, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So how do you diagnose this? Well, they're going to have elevated plasma and urine levels of leucine, isoleucine, valine, and alloisoleucine with decreased, this is big, decreased levels of plasma alanine. That's, that's key to remember that. Decreased levels of plasma alanine. Okay, so pay attention to that with MSUD. Because that could be a good tip-off. Now, the urine precipitant test and neuroimaging in the acute state um, show cerebral edema. Just swelling of the brain, you know. Uh, the presenting signs and symptoms 
they have alternating hypertonicity and flaccicity convulsions, and they're also usually present hypoglycemic. And the reason they call it maple syrup urine disease is the odor that is given off by these, these patients. They have a maple syrup smell to their urine, sweat, and cerumen. Okay? So they, they smell sweet. They smell like uh, angel mama syrup, you know? So the, what's the treatment for these? The treatment, um, patients should be on a low branched chain amino acid diet, obviously. Um, but you also have frequent serum level monitoring. In the acute stage, intravenous administration of amino acids, other than branched-chained amino acids, has been shown to be to be helpful. Now, if the patient is acidotic, this is important. If the patient is acidotic, because branched-chained amino acids, if the patient is acidotic, this is where it's very important that you immediately administer emergent hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, okay? Because acidosis, remember, can ultimately form what? Gamma aminobutyric acid, to reinforce that point. So GABA will shut down these patients' breathing. Um, uh, you can definitively treat MSUD with a liver transplant. So this guy is not, you, you can beat maple syrup urine disease. They need a liver transplant. They need it soon. So that's MSUD for you. Now we're going to talk about the things you'll probably never see. You'll probably never see a lysosomal storage disease as a doctor either, but uh, the mitochondrial disorders, MRF and MELAS. So what is MRF? It stands for myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers, okay? Now the onset, the on onset, onset is either in childhood or adulthood. Now, there's four features to look for with if with MRF, if the boards go for MRF. They're going to have, number one, myoclonus. They're going to have myoclonic epilepsy. They're going to have ataxia problems. And they're going to also have ragged red fibers on muscle biopsy. So that's your clues for that. What is MELAS? That stands for mitochondrial encephalopathy. Mitochondrial encephalopathy. Uh, you also have lactic acidosis with MELAS, so, you know, GABA connection right there again. These people also have stroke-like episodes. They're not having a stroke. They're having something that looks like a stroke. This causes uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, which are often associated with hemiparesis and cortical blindness. Hemiparesis and cortical blindness. Now, they have recurrent headaches and vomiting a lot. This eventually leads to progressive neuroabnormalities, then coma, then death. I wonder why. Gabba connection, I'm telling you, man. Stuff works. It's shutting them down. So, that, that is why they went through mitochondria. If you don't have those, you have a problem with it. You can't make ATP, and ATP is needed at the cellular level. For every cell in your body's sodium potassium pump to name one of many things that you need ATP for. Now, the MRI, the MRI will show multiple strokes, but not in a vascular pattern. That is really important to, to remember and differentiate this guy. Multiple strokes on the MRI, but not in a vascular pattern. Um, they will have increased, if you measure this, they will have increased lactic acid in the blood and in the urine, not just the blood. Um, and a muscle biopsy is diagnostic and shows ragged red, ragged red fibers as well. So, the next thing we're going to talk about of the mitochondrial diseases is SNM. Lay subacute necrotizing encephalomyopathy. This is also known as Lay's disease. This is a very rare neurometabolic disorder that affects the central nervous system. Now, crucial cells in the brain stem are affected with mutations in mitochondrial DNA. This, as you might expect, causes a chronic lack of energy in the cells, which in turn affects the central nervous system and inhibits, inhibits motor function. Okay? It inhibits motor function. Cells have no energy. It inhibits motor function. Um, the disease is characterized by movement disorders. 
okay? Movement disorders. So we know we're having problems at the basal ganglia, etc. Other symptoms include loss of appetite, vomiting, um, irritability, continuous crying in infants, and, and seizures. A later sign can also be episodes of lactic acidosis, but that's later on. So there is no effective treatment regimen, but what we can do is we can put them on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Um, sometimes pediatricians recommend that, but currently there's no really effective treatment regimen for Lay's disease. Now the mucopolysaccharidosis. So an overview of these guys, which is what we're going to talk about first, these are inherited deficiencies of lysosomal enzymes needed for the de degradation of glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs. And what it results in is widespread lysosomal storage of dermatin and heparin sulfate. Definitely need to remember those two. I've seen many, many questions about this. Now, gargoyle cells containing lysosomes that are engorged with mucopolysaccharides is, is, is very indicative of a mucopolysaccharidosis. And the ones we're going to talk about is skin disease or skin syndrome, Hurler syndrome, and Hunter syndrome. Okay? Um, but these, these are the ones I want, to, I want to give you first. I want to give you an overview of what they are. Now, these, um, you have excessive urinary excretions of glycosaminoglycans, okay? Excessive urinary excretions of GAGs. They have, that's number one, they have coarse facial features and they also have very stiff joints. Uh, my mom's brother, one of her brothers actually had um, Morchios disease, which falls under this. We're not going to talk about it. It's not that high yield for the boards, but these are very interesting diseases. Um, detection of the enzyme deficiency in leukocytes or cultured fibroblasts is needed needed to make a diagnosis. Detection of the enzyme of the GAGs in leukocytes or cultured fibroblasts is needed to make the diagnosis. Um, now, rotoenterogenographic changes are consistent with dystosis multiplexy. So, that's a bunch of fancy words. I wouldn't worry too much about that. So let's talk about the first one, Ski syndrome. This is autosomally recessive inheritance. Now, it's a milder, milder form of hurlers with normal intelligence. That's important to keep that in mind. That's, that's a lot of clues right there. And relatively, these, these guys with Ski syndrome have a normal lifespan. They do have corneal clouding. Um, they're going to have stiff joints and aortic regurgitation. So what type of heart murmur would you hear in ski syndrome? Well, what is aortic insufficiency, also known as aortic regurgitation? It's when the pressure in the left ventricle falls below the pressure in the aorta. So the aortic valve is not able to completely close anymore. Um, this causes a leaking of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle. This means that some of the blood that was already ejected from the heart um, is regurgitating back into the heart. Um, so the percentage of blood that regurgitates back through the aortic valve um, due to aortic regurg is known as the regurgitant fraction. Regurgitant fraction. Now, the regurgitant flow causes a decrease in diastolic blood pressure in the aorta, and therefore you see an increase in pulse pressure in aortic regurgs. You see an increase in pulse pressure, which is nothing more than systolic minus diastolic pressure. Um, because you have a decrease in diastolic pressure, you see an increase in the pulse pressure. Thus, the physical exam, this is why they always say you see bounding pulses. Bounding pulses is a good clue for aortic regurg, especially in what artery? Especially in the radial artery. So, that is enough about ski syndrome. Let's talk more about the two you're going to be tested on. And the first one up is Hurler's syndrome. This is autosomally recessively inherited. 
um, it has a problem with the enzyme alpha L iuronidase deficiency. Alpha L iuronidase. It is a severe and progressive with a clinical onset at one year of age and death by 10 years of age. You'll see mental retardation, heart disease, corneal clouding, corneal clouding, organomegaly, and coarse faces or coarse facial features. You will also see um, an obstructive airway disease. So it could look like cystic fibrosis, emphysema, um, all kinds of other things. But you also see this um, dystosis multiplexi. Dystosis multiplexi. You also see an enlarged tongue like you see in Down syndrome. Um, they're going to have hearing loss and they're going to have a limited language in Hurler's syndrome. Now, another way of saying uh, Hurler's syndrome is mucopolysaccharidosis type 1. Mucopolysaccharidosis type 1. And this is where these, these kids look like gargoyles. So you're going to see things like gargoyleism. Um, they can hint to it that way on the boards. So that is Hurler's syndrome. What is Hunter's syndrome? Well, he's a little different. He is X-linked recessive. X-linked recessive. Now he has a deficiency of the iduronidate 2 sulfatase deficiency. Okay? Iduronate 2 sulfatase deficiency seen in Hunter's syndrome. You also see um, dystosis mu uh, multiplexy, mental retardation, organomegaly, and coarse facial features. He will have a clear cornea, but this one is associated with retinitis and papilla edema um, in severe cases. Rem um, I always remember this one that uh, in order to be a hunter, you need good vision. So you see clear corneas um, and you shoot for the X. So that's why it's X-linked recessive. But, you know, it is what it is. That's hunter syndrome for you. So organic acid disorders. Propionic acidemia, this is autosomal recessive, um, recessively inherited. It presents very early in the neonatal period. Almost, It can present almost immediately in newborns with progressive encephalopathy. See, I told you there was a lot of overlap with these things. Um, death usually occurs secondary to hyperammonia levels or increased ammonia levels, which the liver can't handle and, you know, the kidney runs 10% of the urea cycle, so the enzyme in there in the collecting duct called glutaminase, it gets overwhelmed, and you get what you get. You get a patorenal syndrome. So that also, with the hyperammonemia, that's going to make GABA in the brain. They also die of infections, um, cardiomyopathy, but interestingly enough, also basal ganglia strokes. Basal ganglia strokes. So what is this? Um, uh, it's also called propionyl CoA carboxylase deficiency. Um, and also it is called ketoic glycinemia. Or ketotic. Glycinemia. So those are ways of saying the same thing. It's just a propionic acidemia. Now, in healthy individuals, the enzyme propanol CoA carboxylase converts propanol CoA to methyl malonyl CoA, and that's where methyl malonyl CoA mutates. One of the two um, enzymes of vitamin B12 works, right? And we recycle that into the Krebs system. So this is one step in the process of converting certain amino acids and fats into what? Sugar or energy to make ATP to run the cellular metabolism of all cells. So individuals with propionyl CoA carboxylase deficiency cannot perform this conversion because the enzyme propionyl CoA carboxylase is non-functional. Okay. Um, in many cases, 
they have damage to the brain, the heart, the liver, they have seizures, therefore, delays in normal development, they're going to have problems walking and talking. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to distinguish these disorders from, from one another because there's a ton of overlap. So you just got to look for that one thing. Um, all right, but I think we did a good job with that. Gluteric acidemia type 1. This is where the body cannot break down three things, lysine, hydroxylysine, and tryptophan. What's tryptophan a precursor of? Yeah, serotonin, right? Um, excessive levels of their intermediate breakdown products accumulate and damage, you got it, the brain, especially the basal ganglia. So with these organic acid disorders, the basal ganglia is getting nailed, and therefore we're going to have problems with movement regulation. This is very interesting. Now, luteric acidemia type 1 causes a secondary, which a lot of these organic acid disorders do this, but this one in particular causes a carnitine deficiency because gluteric acid is detoxified by carnitine, okay? So what can we do about this? Well, whole we can we can do things like supplement um, whole blood carnitine by, by trying to raise it by oral supplementation. However, we found that this does not significantly change blood concentrations of what is important is gluteral carnitine and esterified carnitine. So, and this suggests that, you know, oral supplementation is suboptimal in raising levels of carnitine, which we need, um, which we need for detoxification of gluteric acid. And notice uh, acid in that word, GABA connection maybe. Uh, so what, what we can do, or what we have found is that intravenous um, infusion uh, of carnitine does significantly um, raise raise the uh, the levels of carnitine, um, and you can see distinct clinical improvements. It's not quite curing it, but you see improvements. Okay, so that's gluteric acidemia type one. Now methylmalonic acidemia. This is autosomal recessive in inheritance. It presents with progressive encephalopathy and secondary hyperammonemia. Um, you have defects in the metabolic pathway where methyl malonyl coenzyme A is converted into succinyl CoA by the enzyme we were talking about earlier, methyl malonyl CoA mutase. Very important enzyme. Um, and remember, succinyl CoA is where odd cycle um, fats are cycled into the Krebs cycle for specifically the one I remember is myelin. Myelin is an odd chain carbon fat. And like we said here before, this um, re this enzyme requires vitamin B12. So let's let's get a new page here and understand more of, of why this happened. Remember I said odd chain fats cycle in here? Odd chain fatty acids. Um, also cholesterol. And you'll see why this is such a problem. Now there's four um, four amino acids: methionine, threonine, threonine, isoleucine, and valine. Cycle in here as well. So these come together to go into the three carbon propanyl CoA. Propanyl CoA. Um, and that is converted into methyl malonyl CoA, which is four carbons. carbons and the enzyme that does that is propanyl CoA carboxylase. Now what is a cofactor for any carboxylase? Somebody tell me. There you go. Biotin, which is produced by your gut floor. Very good. 
Now, what happens after we make methyl malonyl CoA is we take that four carbons and we use vitamin B12 to turn it in to succinyl CoA. Succinyl CoA, which goes on into the Krebs cycle or gluconeogenesis. And like I said, this is where methyl malonyl CoA mutase comes in, which requires vitamin B12. So that is how all that is working. So if we have a problem with methyl malonyl CoA mutase, or if we have a vitamin B12 deficiency, guess what happens? This guy's out. So he is going to build up. He is going to build up. These guys are going to build up, as where is succinyl CoA is going to go down. So therefore, we don't have him to feed into the Krebs cycle, so we can't run the Krebs cycle nearly as well at this position, and we don't run gluconeogenesis, so that's why you're going to see hypoglycemia. So if you really understand biochemistry, you don't have to memorize things. You can just figure out what you're going to see and what you're not, what you expect to see. So that's why we see the things we do with methyl malonic acidemia. And moving, the next one is 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaronyl-CoA lysase, lyase deficiency. <laughs> say that one more time. 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaronyl-CoA lyase deficiency, also known as hydroxymethylglutaric aciduria, or the one I like. Good Lord, that's a lot of words. HMGA-CoA lyase deficiency. I like it that, that way because I know what, okay, I can figure out by the enzyme's name what, what's going on here. Um, before we get into the genes and the enzyme and all that, there's two things that I really want you to pay attention to. The body, when this disorder, the body cannot properly make the amino acid leucine. Remember, he was one of your branch-chain amino acids. And the body also cannot make ketones to... In the fasting state, you know, your brain uses ketones for energy. So there's no energy in the fasting state. That's a big problem. So this is a mutation of the HMGCL gene. Um, it plays an essential role in breaking down dietary proteins and fats for energy. Even though it is a very rare disorder, um, it can present with vomiting, dehydration, lethargy, convulsions, coma, and metabolic acidosis. So I'm sure you can tie all those things in together. But now on a, for a differential diagnosis, um, this disorder is often mistaken for Rye syndrome. That's another very important thing here. It's often mistaken for Rye syndrome, um, which is a severe disorder that develops in children while they appear to be recovering from like a viral infection, such as the chicken pox or the flu. Um, most cases of Rye syndrome are associated with the use of aspirin during these viral, uh, viral infections. So, um, HMG-CoA lyase deficiency, because you have a lack of ketones, that's going to lead to um, hypoglycemia and compounds, which are organic acids, which are formed as products of amino, amino acid and fat breakdown can cause the blood to become too acidic, right? So, Metabolic acidosis along with hypoglycemia, that impairs tissue function, especially where? Especially in the CNS. CNS impairment. Now, another one, isovaleric acidemia. This is also autosomal recessive. It is a metabolic disorder which disrupts or prevents normal metabolism of the branch-chain amino acid leucine. You don't say. Now, here's your clue for this guy. He has a characteristic feature um, that is of a distinctive odor as sweaty feet. If they ever say that on the boards, go right to isovaleric acidemia. 
this odor is caused, the sweaty feet odor is caused by a buildup of isovaleric acid. Okay? So another way of saying this is isovaleric um, acid CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. I like to write these in there because you never know. Um, the boards like to play games with you and make you think you never heard of something when you actually have. Valeric acid CoA dehydrogenase. Deficiency. Okay. Now, what happens here is... Well, before we get to that, we're also going to see half the cases become apparent within a few days after birth and the other half appear during childhood. Um, the signs and symptoms, you're going to see poor feeding, vomiting, seizures, no surprise there, and you got it, a lack of energy, which is going to lead to a coma, which is going to lead to death. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Now, the diagnosis, how do we diagnose this? There, the urine of newborns can be screened um, can be screened for isovaleric acidemia using mass spectro spectrometry, um, allowing for early diagnosis. So you're going to see increases in something called isovaleric glycine. in the urine. as well as isovaleral carnitine in the plasma. You will see this on mass spectrometry. And that's how you can identify um, an isovaleric acidemia really quick. Isovaleral glycine in the urine and increases in isovaleral carnitine in the plasma. Okay, PKU phenylketonuria. What is this guy? PKU is an inherited disorder of amino acid metabolism in which phenylalanine cannot cannot be converted to tyrosine. Y'all know these these conversions. So you have phenylalanine, which gets converted to tyrosine which gets converted to L-dopa, which gets converted to dopamine, which gets converted to norepinephrine, and then eventually we add a methyl group and we get epinephrine. So that is the process of what we're doing in the enzyme that we're missing is right there. And that's why we say phenylketonuria. And this is a phenylalanine hydroxylase deficiency, okay? It is another thing like galactosemia. This is screened for in all newborns. It's mandatory to screen for this. And why do you think that is? Patients are usually normal at birth, but they develop severe mental retardation if not treated. Now, the reason is, what, what do you think we want to give them? Now, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but all you have to do if you're missing the enzyme right here this is going to be down, and this is going to be up. So if we want this pathway to continue this way, we give them tyrosine. We just said tyrosine, they're done. That's why we limit phenylalanine and increase dietary tyrosine, and that keeps them from being mentally retarded. Um, you also see hypopigmentation. Now, why would you see hypopigmentation in PKU? You see hypopigmentation due to the lack of tyrosine because you need tyrosine to make melanin. Um, you also see eczema. You see a mousy or a musty body odor. And you also see hypotonia. Okay? Now, if it is not tested neonatally or screened for in a newborn, which it should be, diagnosis is usually made at four to six months of age. Um, so now prenatal and carrier testing is possible. So if, if you knew that you had a child with PKU, you have to have or strict dietary restriction during pregnancy. And the main thing is to stay away from artificial sweeteners, especially aspartame. Because we know aspartame has a ton of phenylalanine in it um, and other artificial 
um, sweeteners do as well. So that's how that's how this PKU came about, and that's that's basically what it is. So Lesh Nyan syndrome, we're going to talk about purine metabolism disorders. He is X-linked recessive. I would remember anything that's X-linked recessive. So what happens in this disease is purines get deposited into tissues. Now Lesh Nyan's is caused by a deficiency of hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase or HGPRT for short. That's what you're deficient in. Now the signs and symptoms you see is delayed motor development, um, choreothosis at one year of age, spastic cerebral palsy, and the two they're going to go for, and this is a big clue, self-injurious behavior like biting the fingers, banging their heads. Why are they doing this? Well, a child wants to be able to feel, you know, that's how he adapts his surrounding, that's how his brain develops the connections it needs, and, and that's how he has time and space awareness. This kid can't feel nothing, right? Because he's in a low energy state, he has no ATP, you need ATP for your nerves, he can't feel anything, so he's just beating the hell out of himself. And another thing, these kids get gout, so they have hyperuricemia from the purines that are getting deposited in the tissue. Um, so they get... From the hyperuricemia, they get TOFI, they get neuropathy, and they also get urinary tract colliculi. Urinary tract colliculi. Now, treatment is supported with allopurinol allopurinol and that's used to reduce the serum uric acid levels and death usually occurs in less nine syndrome or around the second or third decade of life they're not going to live past 30 so it's a very sad disease um, as well as all these are um, so tyrosinemia okay so we talked about PKU what is tyrosinemia this is a deficiency of fumarol ac acetoacetate hydroxylase or F AH for short. It's a severe, severe disease of the liver, kidney, and peripheral nerve. Now, organ damage, um, organ damage is believed to result from the accumulation of metabolites of tyrosine degradation, especially this guy. See him over and over. Succinyl acetone. They think he is what is responsible for all this organ damage. Now, Tyrosinemia type 1, it has an autosomal recessive inheritance trait, and the FAH, which stands for fumarol, fumarol acetoacetate hydroxylase, the FAH gene maps to chromosome 15Q. It's important to remember that. Um, numerous mutations have been reported. Now, interestingly enough, there is a very, very specific group at risk for this specific mutation on chromosome 15Q. And that is French Canadians from the Saguenay Lac Saint Jean Jean region of Quebec. So I'm just going to remember French Canadians from Quebec. I'm not trying to remember all that other stuff, and they don't expect you to either. But these people are very susceptible to FAH gene mutation. Now, the signs and symptoms: if left untreated, the affected infant appears normal at birth and typically presents two to six months at age. Now, the earlier the presentation, obviously the worse for the prognosis it is. Um, you can have an acute hepatic crisis, which commonly heralds the onset of this disease and is usually precipitated um, by an intercurrent illness that produces a catabolic state. So fever, irritability, vomiting, hemorrhage, hepatomegaly, which is the jaundice, um, elevated levels of serum transaminases, and hypoglycemia are all common. Now, what's really interesting is a odor resembling boiled cabbage um, exists in these patients, and it may be present. And that is due to increased methionine metabolites. So methionine smells like boiled cabbage. Um, they will have episodes of acute peripheral neuropathy that can resemble acute intermittent porphyria. That is very high yield to know. So um, acute intermittent porphyria, you need to have this 
to impress your attending tyrosinemia on your differential when you think somebody might have a porphyria. Um, that's around 40% of affected children. Now, renal involvement is manifested as a Fanconi-like syndrome with a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, a hyperphosphaturia, a hypophosphatemia, and vitamin D resistant rickets. How cool is that? So not only can it be mistaken for acute intermittent porphyria, but it can also be mistaken for Fanconi syndrome because it's Fanconi-like. Now, the diagnosis and screening, the presence of elevated levels of succinyl acetate in the serum and the urine is diagnostic. Diagnostic for tyrosinemia. Okay? So how do you treat this? You treat it with a diet low in phenylalanine and tyrosine. So the only difference in this and PKU is you want low tyrosine and low phenylalanine. Um, notice this can slow, but it does not halt the progression of the condition. Now, the treatment of choice is NTBC or nitrosinol, which inhibits tyrosine degradation at 4 HPPD. Now, an effective therapy for tyrosinemia type 1, and it alleviates the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, is obviously a liver transplant. So that's what we can do because they're at a very high risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So let's talk. That brings us right into the urea cycle and the urea cycle deficiencies. One thing cool about the urea cycle is it is the one cycle that never takes a break or shuts off. It can't, right? Because it's getting rid of what? It's taking the nitrogen from amino acids and getting rid of them because otherwise ammonia would build up and we know that's going to eventually lead to GABA in the brain and shut everything down, right? So this cycle never shuts off. It's the catabolism of amino acids which leads to the production of free ammonia. Right? I said GABA connection in there. In mammals, ammonia is detoxified to water-soluble urea so we can eliminate it through the kidney. And that's done through this urea cycle. And like I said, the urea cycle never shuts off, and we just talked about why. Um, five enzymes are involved in the synthesis of urea. That's carbamyl phosphate synthase, ornithine transcarbamylase, or OTC. Um, those are the two important, by the way. Arginosuccinate synthetase and arginosuccinate lyse, as well as arginase. Now... The prevalence of urea cycle enzyme deficiencies are about 1 in 30,000 live births. They are the most common genetic causes of hyperammonemia in infants. Definitely remember that. You see hyperammonia levels right away in infants or whoever, think urea cycle problem. Okay? They're by far the most genetic cause. So, arginase deficiency. He has an autosomal recessive trait. So there are two genetically um, distinct arginases in humans. There is one that is cytosolic, which is A1, and is expressed in two places, the liver and the urethrocytes, or the red blood cells, okay? And then you have A2, which is in the mitochondria, and he is found in the renal, um, or the kidneys and the brain. So the onset is usually insidious, the infant usually remains asymptomatic in the first few months or sometimes years of life, and a progressive spastic diplegia with scissoring of the lower extremities um, develop. And they also get chore um, choreoacanthotic movements, loss of developmental milestones, and a previously normal infant may suggest a degenerative disease of the CNS. So laboratory findings in this um, include a marked elevation of arginine in the plasma and the CSF. That's how you know you have an arginase deficiency. Marketed increased levels of arginine in the plasma and the CSF. Now, urinary erotic acid is moderately increased, and the diagnosis is confirmed by assaying arginase activity in the red blood cells. 
Now, treatment for arginase deficiency consists of a low-protein diet, a low-protein diet devoid of arginine, administration of a synthetic protein made of essential amino acids usually results in a dramatic decrease in plasma arginine concentration and an improvement in what? It improves neurological abnormalities. And that takes us right into arginosuccinic acidemia. What is this guy? Well, his laboratory findings include, as you might guess, hyperaminemia, moderate elevations in LFTs or liver enzymes, nonspecific increases in plasma glutamine, plasma glutamine, and alanine, as well as moderate increases in plasma citrulline. Um, this is less than is seen in what? Citrullinemia and a marked increase in plasma levels of arginosuccinic acid. Arginosuccinic acid. Now, the abnormalities of the hair characterized by dryness and brittleness, which is no more than, you know, they don't have energy to re replicate themselves, are of special diagnostic value. And that is known as trichorahexis nodosa. Definitely remember that. When you see that, they're talking about arginosuccinic acidemia, okay? So let's understand the urea cycle so we can predict um, arginase deficiency and arginosuccinic acidemia. All right, so let's look at these two. We, we're talking about arginase deficiency and arginosuccinic acidemia. So if we take a look here at the urea cycle, um, you kind of can see what's going on. So it involves the mitochondria, and this out here is the cytoplasm. And remember, 90% of this takes place in where? The liver, okay? So that's what cycles these um, ammonia groups out of this. So as you can see right here, here is the ammonia group from um, amino acids. And what happens is carbamyl phosphate 1 right here, which is in the mitochondria, um, converts um, ornithine, or actually, it makes carbamyl phosphate, okay? And then ornithine, which is coming back from the urea cycle, enters the mitochondria. And then ornithine transcarbamylase turns that using energy in the form of what? ATP. So that's why it's so important to breathe and have oxygen at that final electron acceptor position to make ATP. You wouldn't be able to run this without it. So we take that ATP and through ornithine transcarbamylase, um, we turn carbamyl phosphate, um, we strip some um, energy from him, and we end up with citrulline, okay? Now, the citrulline is then shuttled out, shuttled out, um, and then the enzyme um, arginosuccinate synthase. Arginosuccinate synthase, again, requires energy, and we get rid of all our aspartate atoms here, um, which is amino acid. That gets converted to AMP, and you get a phosphate left over to create which one we were talking about, arginosuccinate. Then arginosuccinate lyase right here creates arginine. And then this is how we get rid of urea. Water comes in through the enzyme um, arginase when we want to start the cycle back over with ornithine. It gets turned into water-soluble urea, which can go to the kidneys for excretion. And this is done with the help of arginase. So if you look back now at the two that we talked about, an arginase deficiency, you have an increased arginine in the plasma and the CSF. Let's see why. If arginase is defective, what's going to happen? This is going to build up like crazy. Arginine, right? So that explains why we see a lot of arginine in the plasma because it's already out in um, the cytosol and the CSF. But the other one we talked about was arginosuccinic acid acidemia. We said you will see increase in plasma glutamine, alanine, as well as citrulline. 
um, and a marked increase in plasma levels of arginosuccinic acid. And right here is arginosuccinate, right? So if we have a problem with arginosuccinate synthase right here, these levels, arginate is going to go down, and arginosuccinate is going to go up, and so is the aspartate, and so is the citrulline, okay? So that's how that works. You just got to know this cycle, and you just got to know if I block here, what's behind it. It's this simple. If we have A to B to C, and I knock out B, then A is going to build up, and C is going to decrease. It's that simple, and you can apply this concept a million different ways, but this is just an example of how they do it with the urea cycle and what you're expected to know. So I hope that helped with inborn errors of metabolism. It's more of a biochemistry lecture than it is a pediatrics uh, lecture, but you're responsible for it um, either way. So good luck on your exam. So these are fun. Um, all right.